Welcome back to the RSET training, Earth Observations for Humanitarian Applications. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm an RSET trainer at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all back to the third and final part of the webinar series. The following slides provide an overview of the three-part webinar series. Why would somebody want to take this training? Well, more than 114 million individuals have been forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. Refugees, internally displaced people, or IDPs, and other displaced populations are made more vulnerable to climate change impacts due to their socio-political marginalization. Recent Earth observation-driven research that recognizes this has made progress toward characterizing the manner and magnitude of climate-related risks in humanitarian settings. By the end of this training series, Participants will be able to recognize the importance of measuring flood risk, long-term heat stress, and drought effects in refugee and IDP communities around the world. Apply workflows incorporating Earth observations, geospatial, and demographic data to identify localized climate risk in refugee and IDP settings. Discuss decision-making strategies for mapping and managing climate conditions with risks faced by refugee and IDP communities and summarize opportunities and shortcomings of specific Earth observations and geospatial datasets for climate risk and development indicators in humanitarian settings. Prerequisites for the three-part training are listed below, along with links to each training. The specific prerequisites for part three of the training are as follows. A general understanding of Google Earth Engine regarding account management, authentication, using the code editor, and recognizing computation memory limits. Familiarity with the Google Colab environment regarding file management and how to mount and access Google Drive. Python knowledge and familiarity with popular scientific computing and visualization libraries and troubleshooting skills. Experience with remote sensing topics such as biophysical remote sensing basics and commonly used sensors along with their characteristics. And an understanding of commonly used vector and raster data formats and descriptive statistics. Over these three weeks, from June 6th to June 20th, there will be three one and a half hour sessions which will include presentations, demonstrations, and question and answer sessions. All materials, code, and recordings from each session will be available from the training webpage. If you are not able to attend one part, a recording will be made available within 48 hours of the training day on the RSET website. Homework is now accessible from the training page with the due date of July 5th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment by the given due date. Please put your questions in the questions box and we will address them at the end of the presentation and demonstration. Feel free to answer your questions as we go. We will try to get to all the questions during the Q&A session after the webinar. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which will be posted to the training website by next week. It is now my pleasure to introduce the guest trainers for today's webinar. Sitian Xiang, a PhD candidate at Clark University, <clears throat> Dr. Lyndon Estes, an associate professor at Clark University, and Dr. Jamin Vandenhoek, an associate professor, professor of geography at Oregon State University. Sitian and Jamin, over to you. Thank you, Sean. My name is Sitian. I'm a PhD candidate in geography at Clark University. Thanks, Sean. This is um, Jamin Vanenhoek. I'm an associate professor of geography at Oregon State University and happy to have you all join us today with Sitian and Lyndon here. Um, we're going to be presenting on part three of this RSET Earth Observations for Humanitarian Applications training, which is focused on tracking drought effects on agricultural landscapes in refugee settings. We're going to jump into the material here um, by way of background. Um, this, all of these trainings are focused on displaced populations. This one in particular is looking at uh, refugee settings. You know, this is a global uh, refugee displacement is a global phenomenon. Um, there are over six, uh, 36 million refugees across uh, 132 countries in the world. You can see the, the distribution here. It's um, broadly a, a sub-Saharan African um, 
scenario of uh, refugee hosting countries. But of course, we have uh, many, many other countries outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, also hosting countries across the Middle East, South Asia, Eastern Europe. Um, we have three settlements in um, the Western Hemisphere as well. Um, so we really have a, a broad um, sweep of environmental, climatic, social, cultural conditions across this whole range of, of refugee settlements that are illustrated on this map here. One of the reasons that we're undertaking this training today is to try to start really taking stock of some of the climate change impacts um, that are in some cases already occurring, but certainly um, expected to occur much more in much more intensive ways in, in decades to come. Um, this is a figure from um, the Shu et al. 2020 paper showing suitability change across the world where the darker red uh, areas are those that are expected to be much less suitable for human beings. Um, this is the, the so-called human climate niche paper. Um, you know, this is a, a phenomenon that we're, uh, th this sort of, this pattern of decreased suitability, we see this all around the world, but um, there's a pretty good agreement with some of the current refugee hosting regions. Um, those areas that we're seeing today with hosting millions of people are also some of the areas that are expected to see some of the greatest decline in overall suitability um, as we go forward. We're also really motivated uh, to do this study just simply because of the sheer volume, uh, the sheer number of refugees um, around the world were um, recent estimates, this is through mid 2023, um, point to refugees making up about a third of total um, forcibly displaced population around the world. Um, as you can see here, uh, there's perhaps two trends I'd like to point out. The first is that this is an increasing uh, rate of, uh, or, or this is an increasing trend in terms of total uh, forcibly displaced population each year we have a new assessment and really since 2011 um, it's increased every single year in terms of the total population most of that bar that you're seeing there is internally displaced peoples that's what that idp stands for internally displaced um, peoples um, and then above that is what we're focused on today more is the refugees under unhcr that's the un humanitarian or refugee agency um, that that dark blue is is the refugee population that's also increasing year on um, since uh, 2011. Um, we're at a a stage now where refugees um, who have been forcibly displaced from their home countries due to violence or persecution, um, while they've been granted protection over uh, in international boundary or, or I should say over the the um, nearby. Uh, national border, they've been granted asylum protections. Um, these these kinds of uh, policies that protect refugees vary country to country. Um, there's uh, quite a range of different permissions that refugees are afforded. Um, we're going to be focused on one of the countries that has the most liberal policies, that's Uganda in East Africa. Uh, this happens to be the largest refugee hosting country in Africa. Uh, there's uh, over um, estimates are at least over 1.5 million people. This is a, a, another uh, estimate um, on the right there that, that's putting total re uh, refugees and asylum seekers at uh, close to 1.7 million people. The majority are from South Sudan, um, though we have a large portion from Democratic Republic of the Congo as well. Um, as I mentioned, Uganda has its what's considered a liberal set of refugee policies. There are um, a lot of permissions that um, refugees have in Uganda. We'll talk some uh, about some of these, but one of these is that the refugee uh, population centers, uh, while they're rural, they're not called camps in Uganda, unlike most other refugee hosting countries. These are settlements um, where there's freedom of movement, there's freedom uh, to access land. There are livelihood opportunities that are centered in these communities, there are ways of making money. There are ways of buying and selling things, just like a lot of other communities in the regions. Um, and this this, this sort of um, configuration of of how settlements are designed and the access that uh, refugees are given creates some new opportunities um, for self sufficiency and food security that 
uh, refugees in Uganda have access to that that other uh, refugees in other countries um, perhaps don't. Um, one of the concerns is, um, of course, conditions such as drought are going to be uh, are already having some worrying effects of reducing access to clean and safe water, increasing malnutrition and hunger. And overall, um, there are a lot of um, concerns over sustainable food security in Uganda. We, we, as I mentioned, we do have this so-called self-reliance approach um, to supporting food security for refugees and livelihood uh, and their and their livelihoods in Uganda. Um, but this isn't a panacea. Um, we still have a lot of challenges of um, producing enough for, uh, for refugees, of producing enough food for their own consumption. Um, you can see one of these statistics um, where 35% of refugee households primarily rely on food aid to meet their basic needs. So that's external food aid. That's uh, food aid um, produced elsewhere and, and brought in um, directly to refugee settlements. Um, so there's a there's sort of a balanced, um, there's a broader, and you could consider it a broader portfolio of options to achieve food security in uh, refugee settlements in Uganda compared to other areas because of that access to land. Um, but we also have these external challenges in terms of changes in precipitation and temperature that's already being shown to reduce crop yield um, in uh, refugee hosting regions in Uganda. Um, we're seeing climate projections showing a greater likelihood of extreme events such as droughts and floods. Well, those are probably going to translate into decreased crop productivity. So um, there are some potentially serious considerable challenges ahead in terms of really following through on the promise of this self-reliance, um, this uh, plan for self-sufficiency, plan for self-reliance um, that's being enacted through the asylum policy um, that that um, sort of dictates uh, refugee, uh, the rights that refugees have. Um, so that's, that's really where we're coming at with this training is to try to think about how we can use uh, demonstrate how we can use earth observation data to start pinning down some of these changes in precipitation and, and temperature and how those translate into impacts on, on crop yield. I'm going to hand it over to Sitian for um, background on some of the earth observation approach, as well as the coding walkthrough now. Thanks, Jamin, for introducing us to the refugee situation around the world and in Uganda. This is really important contextual knowledge. And here's another map for your reference. It highlights the global crop conditions for major crop types. And we can see that many refugee hosting countries, Jamin just talked about, are in um, East Africa and Southeast Asia, where the crops in there were also listed as quite marginal condition. For Uganda um, here, so, um, the entire country was classified as need to be cautious. So this is really calls for a closer and timely investigation. And for the rest of the session, I will discuss the Earth, the Earth's observation and demonstrate with the Python code and how we use it to understand general crop productivity and its potential interactions with climate trends, variations, and how we may apply this type of analysis in refugee livelihood settings. So I hope this session will be helpful for you to design your own analysis or understand some of this type of analysis better. So using, using Earth observation to understand crop productivity actually involves a variety of tools and interdisciplinary knowledge. So as you, you can see in this picture on the right, um, there is a maize field equipped with something mounted on it. So it is not for irrigation, um, actually, it's it's a ground sensor to collect the canopy development data over time. So, or maybe also have a um, multispectral sensor on it. So, scientists are trying to establish some relationship between crop growing procedure with something that you can observe from the sky. So, one relationship was found is between the leaf area, biomass generation, and optical bands that detected by sensors. So between the leaf area and biomass, there is a photosynthesis process. So the leaf or green leaf intercept the light and use it to accumulate biomass. So over its growing stage, a crop typically develops its canopy first called vegetative stage. Then as it moves to the reproductive stage, 
the leaves will stop growing, but the plant starts accumulating the consumable parts of the biomass, which are the crop yield. So the leaf is often measured in leaf area index, LEI, and the rate to accumulate biomass is measured in gross primary productivity, GPP, and net primary productivity, NPP. And the leaf, or say, uh, leaf area index was also directly related to several spectral bands of a multispectral sensor. So at the red band, the chlorophyll had a strong absorption and near infrared band, the leaf cell structure had a strong reflection. So the, NDV, so the vegetation index, such as the normalized difference vegetation index or the NDVI, make use of these characteristics and have a simple and summarized indicator um, to infer the leaf area index and therefore the GPP, MPP, and the biomass. And of course, some other bands, red edge here, and short wear infrared, or even other type of sensors like radar, LIDAR, that capture some other aspects of the crop growing, such as the physical structures of a plant, also could be very useful, but um, it's not in the, the scope of this training. So another thing about the NDVI is that the value may saturate in the dense canopies or impact by the soil colors. So there are some other vegetation index designed to overcome these issues, such as soil adjusted VI or enhanced VI. So this is a typical NDVI trajectory of a season. So the blue is raw observation and the red line is fitted curve. So first, the real, of the, the real NDVI is often not as perfect or regular shaped as, a, as the fitted curve. And you will see the later in our hands-on, and as you can see in, the, in our later hands-on practice. This could, be an, this could be caused by error, or it could also reflect the real field management on that cropland. So for example, we see a small peak here followed with a sharp decrease and then uh, it's just come back uh, with a much wider peak, then decrease again. So maybe we can interpret this as the land preparation or clearing of the weed following with the planting, or we can interpret the, the first peak as just noise. But anyway, we know that the shape of a time series in DVI tells you something about the biomass change in the piece of land. So this is where the mathematics were Geo geometry connect to the study of crops. On the right, we have a table of some seasonality parameters that can be extracted from a annual NDVI curve. Um, and they do have physical meanings. So such as we can define the start of a season as a certain percent of green up on the curve, or the end of the season as a certain percent of green down. And also the NDVI under the curve can be um, in a season or say the ND can be interpreted as a, a um, accumulation of biomass over time um, or the general productivity on this land. So also for maize, the date of max and DVI uh, is found often related to the maize tasseling stage and which the NDVI value from this stage will be very closely related, related to the final crop yield. So extracting these parameters and connect to the crop physical parameters at different growing stage is a major task for agricultural remote sensing, or say um, the major way that remote sensing can be used for agricultural related study. Okay, so that's all about the biophysical part. And it just tells you that uh, why we can use NDVI to estimate biomass or even crop yield on a piece of land. And also what exactly are we looking at um, given NDVI time series? So now we can take a look of different sensors and the considerations in choosing a sensor for research. So for me, the first thing I'm looking at is the spatial resolutions. If we are interested in a specific field, um, such as the one we have here in, the, in this picture, uh, then I will choose Sentinel-2 or Landsat and Sentinel-2 is even better for its 10 meter resolution. So take a look at this uh, inset map B. 
So that's Sentinel, Sentinel-2 NDVI map. You can see the internal variations of NDVI within the field. So MODIS cannot, unless that field is larger than 205, uh, 250 meters, MODIS pixel. Then you have to think about the nature of cropland in this region that you want to study. So do they have large field? If they don't, and are they similar and close enough so we can treat them as large field? If the answer is yes, then the modis would be a good choice. Otherwise, the modis would be too coarse um, comparing to, all, to the object you want to study. The spatial resolution is not everything. And sometimes you want to take a look about the temporal coverage and temporal resolution as well. So especially for long-term phenomena such as climate trend um, or interannual crop yield variation, you will need a long um, temporal coverage, a long record of data to capture the trend. So in this round, mode is win because it gives you about a nearly daily observation and over 20 years of um, the record, whereas the earliest Sentinel-2 data uh, started only from 2015. So the modus in this figure is a 16-day composite um, data product in orange color. Uh, it is made from daily, but it is made from daily observation. So you rarely see a missing value in the time series that breaks the line. For Sentinel-2, it shows in the blue color. Um, you rarely see two connected dots because most dots have missing value in between. And when I say missing value, I'm not saying there's no observations, but it is mostly because of cloud contamination. The cloud can, can happen a lot over a large, large region, especially during the rain season. Even for MODIS, you can see some missing values if we apply this cloud mask. So another thing we can see from this time series is Sentinel-2 and MODIS seems to agree very well. And combining those observations may give you a chance to restore the missing value by each sensor. And well, but this could be a more advanced topic, and we'll keep this sensor separately used in this in this training. But we do have to fill the gaps um, of this missing values, even if we don't care about the missing value at that day, because for some analytical methods, they need a complete and even regular time series to run. So there are a number of methods that can be used for restoring missing values. So it can be as simple as nearest fill, that means using its nearest neighbor to fill the gap. Or you can put more thoughts in this gap filling, gap filling process and guess the most possible value um, to the true value at that day. So maybe you can use a linear interpolation, assuming a linear transition of values between the dates. So basically, this is what gap filling about. Curve feeding sometimes includes the gap filling as part of it, but it's more about reducing the noise in the data. Or you have a shape of NDVI in your mind already, and you just want to adjust a bit using your point observations. So savitsky golay or SG filter is a popular curve fitting method with a moving window that just smooths the NDVI along the way. And it makes no assumption to the overall shape of the NDVI curve. So you can see the yellow and green smoothed line don't really look like the NDVI curve that we've seen in previous slides. That, um, and the peak seems always lower than the row value. And also the seasonalities look strange. It looks like many uh, rocky hills. As opposed to the double logistic model on the upper right, mimicking the single green up and green down process of NDVI curve. But um, you can always adjust these models. So for this SG filter, you can still modify using some assumptions such as NDVI will not drop suddenly uh, when it's at peak. So then we can give higher NDVI, higher weight. So the curve will be pulled up um, a little bit and closer to a double logistic model. So in this case, it would be the, the green line. But what if the season really have two peaks uh, of NDVI, like two plantings, then the basic SG filter might closer to the truth. 
So again, it would be very helpful if we have some institutional knowledge about this place, such as uh, seasonalities or crop management in this farm. So our assumptions in curve fitting will be more close to the truth. Okay, so far we've covered enough about the crop productivity and DBI and DBI time series in the data processing. Now we can take a look at the environmental aspects because that is a major source of uncertainty that impacting the agriculture outcome. So I, I want to combine this part with the trending and regression analysis so we've finished the introduction of this general method. Then we can have some time to look at our study area and code and talk more about our how we apply this method in a refugee setting. So we consider two uh, weather variables, temperature and precipitation, as they are intuitive and closely related to drought and floods and the interannual crop productivity variation. So this map on the left um, is the land surface temperature data, also collected from MODIS with its thermal infrared bands. And it's a daily one kilometer data. So similar to NDVI collected from the sky, satellite derived, derived weather variable data can also be subject to a scale problem and certainty and reliability issues in the estimation. And in terms of sensor characteristics, the temperature and precipitation usually have higher temporal, re temporal resolution but lower spatial resolution. So the precipitation data here we use um, in this training is called CHIRPS and this daily precipitation data at five kilometer resolution. And in this training, we processed into a, a new aggregation of pre precipitation. So just so, so you know that they actually are as, as frequent as the temperature data. So for any long-term observations, we might have two separate concerns. Um, one is long-term trend a subtle process that may lead to a significant difference if we zoom out to a longer historical period, time period. And the other is short-term variation, uh, which are very perceptible and can bring a lot of uncertainties and shocks to daily life. So the method we separate the long-term trend and short-term variability is called detrending analysis. And it could be just as a linear regression against the data and you subtract the, the row value by the fitted line. So then this fitted line is, is the trend and the distance from the row value to this line is short-term variation, which we, could, which we call anomalies. Um, a, a classical use of this detrending analysis is to understand maize yield response to drought in the US over a century as shown in the, uh, in the figure on the left, this one. Um, due to technology advancement and many climate change, we see a huge improvement of maize yield from four metric tons per hectare to about 13, 13 metric tons per hectare in many states in the US. So um, that's the long-term trend, but also we can see a higher variation of this trend in the recent decade because of a more unstable weather than the earlier decades. We can apply this detrending techniques to our annual crop productivity, precipitation, and temperature analysis. So for example, uh, in this figure, what can we say about the trend by observing the dashed lines? So for temperature and crop productivities measured as seasonal NDVI max and, season, and NDVI integral, they are having a decreasing trend and the precipitation is having a increasing trend over time. And of course, you might see um, that for temperature, the year 2000 might be an outlier. And that really made the decreasing trend so prominent. But also it makes a good example to understand the detrending process, like the year 2016, sorry, uh, 2006, 2016, 2024, seems having similar temperature, but given a lower long-term mean, that these years appears as different magnitude of, anomal of anomalies over the entire 24 years. So which is the bars in those um, purple colors.
we can relate the temperature and precipitation to the crop productivity, if either the row value or the anomalies, so to see if there appears some co-variations. And this re relationship might not be linear, might be non-linear. So on the left, we found more rainfall seems to be less beneficial uh, for crop productivity. Uh, if we had a second dim uh, dimension or second dependent variable, say temperature, um, then it became a multivariate regression and may explain the crop productivity variable better given extra information. So if we find a correlation between weather, weather and uh, weather factors and productivity, um, as we do in this example point in northern Uganda, then we might be able to, to use it to predict future or past crop productivity anomalies or apply this prediction in other regions. So that's all for the, the general methodology for this session. And from here, we'll see how to use this method in the refugee setting. Um, and things from here may be less standard and more depending on our own experience from our relevant work. Uh, so the challenge of remote sensing based method is to, to infer some socioeconomic aspect of landscape, of landscape. So for example, socially um, less privileged populations such as smallholder farmers or some refugee populations often um, cultivate smaller field or less fit or in less favorable locations like riverbanks. So from the shape, size of the field, you might be able to locate this population using remote sensing observations with even zero in-situ knowledge. However, this method would be very uncertain and the, the, the verif verification could be challenging. So this is why the spatial data of refugee settlement um, is, so, is so valuable. At least it directs you to a potentially more relevant region. But still, can you tell like up until what distance from a refugee settlement, uh, the cropland will be non-refugee populations? And also, if we want to say something about food security, usually it's going to be related to the crop yield. But estimating crop, crop yield in many data sparse countries is difficult because first you even don't know where uh, what the crop type of that land is growing. So uh, this is why from the very beginning of the session, we focus on the general productivity and the variations. Essentially, it represents the biomass on that land and its variation instead of estimating the, the crop yield. So these are just some questions that, that you can keep thinking about in, in an earth observation based approach. Another contextual knowledge is the cropland location change over time. Um, so the map here you're seeing is the University of Maryland, GLAD, a global and global cropland change map from 2003 to 2019. And, and you can see the cropland usually expand to accommodate a larger population. And this happens all over the world and also in Uganda. So here's the Adramani district of Uganda. So the stable cropland um, is mostly in the north and west, and there are some new cropland on the east. So in your long-term analysis, maybe you want to examine the productivities on the stable cropland where there's no land cover change. Otherwise, the variation of biomass or general productivities could mean different things, and that does not necessarily mean the crop productivity. And this is a very commonly used analysis that in remote sensing community, which is um, analyzing the image on the image level instead of a point level. So we can do an image level analysis of crop productivity as well. So you can see the like the spatial pattern, the gradient, the change of crop productivities and its, var its variations. But for this training, we focus on a single point analysis uh, because we want to focus on the concept of time series and regression analysis. Um, but we do recommend you to take a take a look of this image level analysis. Actually, we provide an optional CoLab notebook that allows you to run the image level time series processing and analysis um, using the Google's engine computing, cloud computing power. 
Actually, this makes even more use of Earth Engine's cloud computing power. So this figure explains um, the technology part, technological part of the workflow design. So if uh, we just use a point-based analysis, I would I would just use Earth Engine to pull the image and do some basic image processing, um, pre-processing, and get a point and get a point data offline, and then I'll put all the gap filling, curve fitting, um, seasonality extraction, correlation analysis, visualization in Python machine learning ecosystem. Um, like using NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, SQLearn, Matplotlib for, for data manipulations. Um, if we're doing image at, if we're doing analysis at image level, then we probably want to keep the image on the cloud and also the analysis on the cloud uh like do the gap gap fit gap fitting gap filling curve fitting seasonality extractions on the earth engine as well so but that is not easy because the earth engine may just provide you basic data man, 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 manipulation functionalities and you have to implement the algorithm that are not readily available on earth engine So uh, before we get into the code, let's just have a brief look at our goal and objectives. So our goal is, so like my goal is try to make you that be able to run your own EO analysis or Earth, of the, Earth observation analysis to help decision making. And so there are a few objectives, retrieve and process satellite imagery for NDVI and weather variables and process those in DVI time series and extract the crop productivity or seasonality metrics and conduct anomaly and or actually conduct the detrendy analysis um, and calculate the anomalies and do the correlation analysis with wet weather factors. Um, and also we are focusing on the uh, upper left part or northwestern part of the Uganda. And here is the Adromani district. So this is um, what you should expect to get. Like for point-based analysis, we have a single point, or actually we're sampling on a single pixel uh, of a, from all these and sending on two. And we extract the NDVI time series converted into an annual um, crop productivities over time. And for region-wise region -wise, uh, analysis, which is optional, that you should be able to see something like this. So this is the, the um, precipitation anomalies and trend. So it pretty covers, like I said, is like in five kilometer spatial resolution, but it reflects some of the spatial patterns, spatial um, change of this precipitation of a year. So we're now going into the demo in collab environment. All right, so this is um, our code. This is what you should see um, in the code. Uh, a few points before we get into the, uh, the coding part. So um, the way we design this uh, notebook is to focus on the method and concept. And we don't optimize the code to be concise or program this into a library. So that means the code could be very long. And you can see some page long functions has been defined. And so we're not trying to scare you. Uh, this is, uh, we can kind of hide this uh, functions, helper functions in a separate script. So you focus on the content, but actually um, we encourage you to uh, take a look of the process of the calculation or the data processing. Um, maybe you can even find an arrow inside and please let us know, hopefully there's no arrows. Uh, and also just feel free to, to adapt these functions methods um, to, uh, with, with some creativities. Um, so this is completely open source, um, you can, you're free to copy this code, uh, rewrite it, 
um, change it, and make them into a part of your analysis. So that what so that's that's work on. Um, another thing is, um, and also the way we design this notebook is to we give you a lot of uh, guidance. So even without us talking through, you should be able to to finish by just you know following those uh, those lines. And but overall, um, there are four parts of this code. So part one, setup and preparation. Here we import necessary libraries. We set up Google Earth Engine account because we're going to you know, pull our data from Earth Engine and do some basic image processing. Um, and also we define some helper functions. And then for part two, uh, it's focused on the, the NDVI time series extraction and uh, some visualization, but also uh, like what, what, is, what we talked in the presentation, um, gap filling, curve smoothing. You should be very familiar to that part of the, the content. Um, part three, that's the productivity analysis and, and environmental analysis. So which we, we use the NDVI time series to, to extract the seasonality parameters or to calculate the producti productivity metrics and do some correlation analysis with um, environmental factors. And for part four is actually a repeat of the part um, two and three, but with a more um, contextual analysis, which in, in this case, we're really trying to understand how the locations of the samples might tell you something about the refugee uh, and non-refugee uh, non agriculture. So let's quickly run through this. Uh, import the packages. Those packages, if you run it in Colab, they should be pre-installed. So you don't, have, you don't need to install them again. You should be able to run, this, run through this. And then, uh, mount your Google Drive. So we will share our like study area um, file in the in the Google Drive. So you have to uh, mount Google Drive to go to be able to access that data. And that opens up a pop up window. You just grant uh, the access to the Google Drive. Uh, so the next part is to authenticate. Um, Google Earth Engine. So basically, it just um, allows you to use your CoLab code to connect with your Google Earth Engine account and run some analyses um, under your account on the Earth Engine. So the setup part could be a, a, a little work for you, but we provide a guide. You can go into there. You follow the instructions, and if you have questions, you can you can always ask or um, or provide help for you. So, and there are actually two ways to authenticate uh, Earth Engine. So one is that you download a private key um, a, as a file, and you you read this key um, using Earth Engine uh, authenticate method. Then you're good to go. So if you have trouble for um, all the configurations of this private key, private key, um, then you can also try to uncomment out this to line and run it. So it will open up a pop-up window and you just uh, do the point and click just at what we did for uh, authenticating or connecting Google Drive. And then um, the next part is you will see a lot of helper functions. Um, so these are the helper functions under, under part one. And they are mostly about uh, remote sensing, imagery processing, or data out export that from the Earth engine. Um, again, if you are interested in, you can go into this code, take a look. Otherwise, you can skip it, but don't forget to run it so you have those functions defined. Um, and then we want to take a look of, of our uh, study area. So we have two geometries. One is called Adjumani. That's the boundary of Adjumani. The other is called settlement. That's the, the refugee um, settlements provided by the 
the UNHCR. So we read them as, uh, so they are in the GeoJSON format and we first load it into Python and then we convert it into, uh, into Earth Engine's feature collection data type. And then here we define a, a, a point with la, uh, longitude and latitude. And also we give this point a name. And so the rest, of, rest part of this code is just to, you know, to the visualization. And if you want to change the location of the point, you can just change these two numbers. So this 31 should be the long, longitude and three should be the latitude. And that's it for part one. So for part one, what we've done is um, set up our um, Google Drive and authenticate Google Earth Engine, define some functions, and have a look of our study area. So now we're going to uh, part two, data extraction and processing. So this part is really just about um, extracting the NDVI time series and do some gap filling and curve fitting just like what, I, what we've seen, what we have seen in the presentation. Um, so this is a typical workflow um, using Earth Engine is that you first, for example, load this Sentinel data product, then you let it pass through a sequence of functions, including like a spatial filter, a temporal filter, and a cloud mask. And also we want to clip uh, each image um, into the boundary of our Azure mining study area. And we do the same thing for MODIS, but because, you know, the, the data products are different. So uh, MODIS, this MODIS product we're using is global mosaic. So there's, you don't have to uh, apply a spatial filter on it, but you can, you can still clip the MODIS data into Azure mining study area. And also do the same thing for annual precipitation and MODIS land surface temperature. And so the next thing we're going to do is to extract NDVI time series from those imagery. Um, here we define more functions. Uh, that's just about part two. And you can see the extraction process actually run very fast. This is because the real computation is not invoked. This is how Earth Engine worked. So it's kind of like you submit a plan, like you want to process the imagery in that way. You want to sample a point on those imagery, and that's it. So it will not really run until you do something like data export or you um, get info, means you pull the data offline from Earth Engine. So here, if you run it, it just export uh, those data extractions um, into your Google Drive um, using like a CSV format. And for here, if you want to keep all the analysis within the co this, this notebook, you can pull it offline directly by using a get info function. So for this sales, um, uh, this is where we really pull the data from Earth Engine offline. And it's just a time series for um, of NDVI and precipitation and land surface temperature. And then here, this part you see, most of the code is um, just about the visualization. So what we really do is to plot it. So we, we have two plots. One is the, the full time series. The other one is, if you pay attention to here, we kind of uh, make it zoom in into the year between 2019 and 2024. And again, you should be very familiar with this, um, all of this output because we've seen this in the presentation. And then this one combined or say to just put the precipitation and temperature together in the visual with the NDVI time series. And this part is about uh, the gap filling curve fitting. 
So we have two different ways to fill the gap. N nearest neighbor, or, or say the nearest field or interpolation. And then this is the uh, curve smoothing using the SG filter. Um, this is, and this is for the MODIS. Sorry, this is for the Sentinel 2. And we do the same thing for MODIS. And that's it. That's it for part two. So by the end of part two, you should be able to have a, uh, a time series of both Sentinel 2 and MODIS. And also um, precipitation and land surface temperature. So for part three, it's about you know uh, taking this time series and extract the seasonalities. Uh, basically, it's just get the NDVI max for each year, and also the NDVI under the curve uh, for each year. Then we same as every part, we define some functions for this part specifically, then we extract the seasonalities and do the um, seasonal we do the, the calculations for the, the NDVI max and NDVI integral for both Sentinel 2 and MODIS. And Now, since we have the time series for MODIS and Sentinel-2, we can do some correlation analysis. Uh, but before that, I think um, this is just a plot for the extracted productivity matrix, NDVI max, NDVI, signal, uh, NDVI integral for MODIS and Sentinel-2. And you can see there's a, there's a drug in 2009, probably indicating a uh, probably indicating a uh, a weather shock, and we do the training analysis on the extract um, and DVI max and DVI integral, and also precipitation and temperature. Again, most of this code are about visualization, and it's just the first. First, a few lines is about the calculation. And we can see the, the long term trend in dash line and anomalies uh, in those bars. And we can do which just by looking at those uh, visuals, it tells a lot about this, this data point. For example, from 2001 to 2013 uh, to 2023. The NDVI max varies a lot. Um, same as precipitation, temperature didn't have much variation until 2017, when it started getting unstable. And also, the NDVI integral uh, and matrix of productivity could be, you know, slightly different from a NDVI max. And then we can relate uh, this uh, time series of productivity with the time series of precipitation. And uh, on the left is the NDVI max, on the right is the NDVI integral, using both of them to, to against uh, any precipitation, you can see a similar result. And So the last one was um, plot on raw data, and this is plot on the detrended data. Yep. So the next thing we're going to do is to calculate curing degree days is based on the daily temperature. And it's a commonly used method to, um, to, to evaluate the temperature's um, effect on the, on the crop productivities. It is calculated as the sum of the daily temperatures at that above certain threshold that could be harmful for the crop. Um, and then here we define as so usually 
for example, it varies crop by crop, and uh, a commonly used threshold could be 29 Celsius degree. And here can we, we set it as 39. You can feel free to change this number. And then, so we compare this killing degree days with our um, NDVI max or NDVI integral anomalies, or essentially the crop product productivity anomalies. So what we see from this um, plot is that the killing degree day is overall positively related to the productivity, but as you have higher killing degree days, so the productivity is, is um, growing slower. And does that mean the killing degree days is not really killing the the productive the crop to lead to a lower productivities? I think that's um, where you have need to have more thoughts. The first thing is the killing degree days we are calculating is on a very rough um, scale. Like we just sum summarize the those degrees over a year, not in the growing season, not for a specific growing season. And also the killing degree days uh, might have more impact on the reproductive stage instead of vegetative stage. So the next part, we can do a multivariate analysis. So instead of analyzing a single variable such as temperature or precipitation, we can put them together um, to fit a model that might give you a more um, explanatory, more more power um, in explaining the variation of the productivities, and we can display uh, this analysis in different ways. We can use a three-dimensional um, plot where you have both um, precipitation and temperature effect on the and DVI the trended integral with a polynomial fit or a linear or planar fit and or with your outline removed so you can focus so you can zoom in um, majority part of the data and also we can take this um, fitted relations between productivity um, temperature and precipitations and make them into a predictive model so we can plot the predicted productivity against the uh, the row observed productivities in a scatter plot or as a time series plot. And so that's all for part three. So part four is it's just a repeat of part two and three. But this time, instead of analyzing a single point, we can put multiple points. And also, these points can, we can put some of the points in a closer positions to the refugee settlement. And some points are more distant to refugee settlement to see if um, we can find some patterns in those different locations that potentially uh, represent the refugee versus non-refugee um, agricultural productivities and their relations with um, weather variables. So here we define four points uh, with four pairs of latitude and longitude. And also we can give them a uh, different name. And then in this code, we're not going to repeat um, everything but we will do the calculation of the productivity for all of those four points. Here we extract uh, the temperature variables. So now instead of a, a single time series, you have four time series combined uh, into a single plot with different colors. And it should be um, the interpretation of this line should be very similar to the interpretation of a single time series. But in this case, we 
use the code colors for the point that are slightly di distant to the refugee settlement. And the warm colors like red and, and yellow um, for the point that sampled within the refugee settlement. And at least based on this result, we can say that the green dots like the DVI time series um, that sampled out uh, distant from refugee settlement seems having a higher NDVI um, in the season and for many years. But also for another site, like another refugee settlement where we have um, the blue and red, the red is the, another refugee site within the refugee settlement. And the blue is uh, the point that's slightly far from it. In this case, we don't see really the red or blue, um, which is higher. Sometimes the blue is higher. Sometimes the, they're similar. And the next one, again, this is just the roll time series of an DVI. We do the, so this time we just put uh, the gap filling curve smoothing together with the seasonality extractions. And if you want to take a look of the process uh, variable, it should be um, organized into a, a pandas data frame. And then we can do some visualizations. So again, so this time it might be easier to see the productivity difference. So on the left, on the right, is seasonal uh, NDVI integral versus seasonal NDVI max in the four sites, actually two pairs of locations. So for refugee one, um, that's, and for the refugee one, actually we don't see a very clear um, trend or we don't see very clear pattern like the refuge within refugee or outside refugee point which is high having higher productivity but for our site two it seems like the green line indicating the point sampled outside of the refugee settlement is high in higher productivity uh, in most of the year and We can also um, do a deep training analysis um, for the productivities for these four points to see um, their like, resilience or their variations of productivities over the year and try to say something about whether um, the refugee agriculture um, is more um, sensitive to climate change or not. That, that's all for the code run through. All right, let's come back to um, the post coding reflection. Uh, we didn't really take a long time uh, or detailed explanation to those code, but um, if you really um, uh, read the instructions and interpretation text, that we put under each step of analysis, you will have a lot of questions and, and thoughts. So basically, um, what I, my reflection from uh, creating this workflow is, so when we do a point-based analysis, we should understand the, the scale. So we could sample on a Sentinel, it could sample on a Mobius pixel scale, come with different size and represent um, different um type or uh the the scale of the object that you are studying and also we use um for productivities and also we um so in this workflow we use vi the ndvi um, as a proxy of pro productivities and you can and we use the gap filling curve smoothing functions first and we extract 
the seasonality is based on the smooth curve. So um, the better curve smoothing might um, give you a better estimation of productivities. And the third scale, this scale is um, a more broad concept, like we just place the point or several points within a small region. Uh, do those points represent that region very well? Or the pattern that we found from those points, do they represent a larger region? Um, and also the refugee agriculture context. So for our part four analysis, that's a really uh, simple and naive method that we just assume that refugee cultivate within or close to their settlement. But do you think that also um, true or always true? And also the crop type and locations, again, our productivities is just the general biomass on that land over time. Um, it does, it could be a challenging to link that with a specific crop type or crop yield. And also that's um, our limitations, that part of our limitations. And also we have a data, you've, you've seen the data coverage problem. Like for MODIS, we have 20 years. For Sentinel-2, we only have a few years of observations. And we have cloud issue. And also the VI and productivity relations uh, might need more uh, cautious as well. And also you've seen the uh, the KDD, the curing degree, uh, curing degree days, that do you think uh, the way we calculate, like the entire, we aggregate, we calculate the curing degree days using the, the, the full seasons, do you think that's a good um, setup as a weather metrics? Similarly, do you think we aggregate the precipitations over the entire year? It's a good representation of um, can capture the like the short term flood, and also those gap filling curve smoothings. Um, as we said, we used SG, SG filter. Um, and do you think this smoothing method can really capture the the real pattern or the the true signals of NDVI of that seasons? Those are some questions we can technological technical questions we can think about. So summary. So for this session. Um, we went through several co fundamental concepts like crop productivity, leaf area index, and NDVI and their relationship, NDVI-based crop productivity metrics, anomaly and the trending analysis, anomaly calculation, and correlation analysis. And we talked through some considerations in EO data and methods, including spatial temporal resolution, um, and also the weather data, the ancillary data, and contextual knowledge that you could use to, to better um, design your, your workflow and also interpret the result. Um, we've mentioned this point-based um, analysis, and also we've mentioned the region-wise region -wise analysis. Um, and also the technical considerations, platform workflows, like how do you place the the computation um, is either offline or on Earth engine. So for our point workflow, most of the computation is offline because it's travel. It's just the processing of time, uh, a single point or a few points of um, time series data. Yeah, and several considerations in the, in the choose of, in the selection of gap filling curve smoothing methods. For your considerations, also maybe you want to um, factor those advancements into your considerations. Those advancements in data and methodologies, uh, for example, advanced, advances in sensors and algorithms. We have uh, more satellite data. And also there are some new product, data products and applications may might make your analysis easier. For example, the harmonized Landsat and Sentinel data, together they will give you a higher spatial resolution, but also a, a more frequent observations, such as the image on the right. Um, you can see for many parts of the world, uh, we can have a 
a at best like a three day data retrieval frequency. Uh, and also, Digital Africa platform that give you some uh, process the data and also the notebook, just like what we showed here. They also have a lot of applications that come with in a in the Jupyter notebook form that help you to get started with your analysis. Since we mentioned that Google Earth Engine may just give you some basic um, data manipulation functions, but also there are some libraries now. Um, that give you a more uh, choice of those data manipulation or an analytical methods. Um, but that's uh, the JavaScript you have to use in the Google Earth Engine editor. So better in situ data and ancillary data, where we have more, a better a crop mask, so we know where are those cropland and or say we have more accurate information about the cropland positions locations and also we have some global soil moisture data which uh, it's also important actually that also explains a lot of the crop productivity variations um, that get, uh, other than just using temperature and precipitations and also the ground truth data we might have more in the farmer survey in situ survey to really um, get the local uh, knowledge, such as um, where are they cultivating, and what is or what crop, what's what's a typical field management management techniques, what's a typical um, field calendars. All of these things might um, helps you to um, to improve your earth observation approach in monitoring the crop productivities and assessing the, the climate effect on the productivity. So now I'm going to hand over this to Jamin for his final remarks. Thanks, Sitian. So um, we have some really nice tools that Sitian has demonstrated about how we can develop some really place-based awareness of impacts on uh, crop productivity in uh, these refugee hosting regions. Um, in doing this work, of course, we're motivated by some of the concerns of expected climate change impacts in refugee hosting regions, but um, there's some quite unique implications of this work too, if we were to try to take it forward and really um, kind of uh, tie it together into our other kinds of information that we use uh, to understand food security, for, uh, for example, in refugee settings. And that's this first bullet point here, uh, you know, we have these localized insights from Earth observation that we can develop anywhere in the world at any time step to, to some extent. Um, we already have, uh, however, a, a kind of far reaching data collection effort um, in many refugee settlements around the world, including those in Uganda, like we've shown here, where um, there are standardized assessments of food security. However, there's um, while those are done through um, surveys and interviews, um, there is sort of a disjoint between what we could say, what we could assess through Earth observation data, and how those um, current food security assessments are conducted. So there's an opportunity really to further integrate these Earth observation derived data at the landscape level, even at say the refugee household level, the specific plot that refugees are, are accessing and managing. And what we can say about that plot, say about the food security or the uh, the climate or the uh, I should say the crop um, productivity or the drought impact at that particular plot or or at that settlement scale uh, with the data that are already being collected in refugee households at the refugee settlement level, um, there's a, an opportunity there to really um, make better use of earth observation data to to um, connect those two different ways of assessing food security better. Um, it's also important to note that while we're focused on refugee populations in this training, um, we don't necessarily know if what we're assessing at um, refugee settlement level or refugee population level is similar to or different from food security conditions in the surrounding area. Um, so that, that's a challenge in two ways. We can't just assume that if we have information on what's happening in one place, we know what's happening to the next. So we can't sort of import um, some assessment of a nearby non-refugee communities, food security or crop productivity, um, and, and assume it's similar in refugee settings, that 
doesn't, uh, we can't confidently do that without testing it. Um, production varies at a local level. Um, and we, we just can't do that in a confident way. We, in fact, need to test these out, uh, examine these, um, simultaneously together, right? We need to understand what's happening in the refugee settings. We need to understand what's happening in surrounding non-refugee regions. That integration that we were speaking about at the very, or the opportunity for, for self, um, sufficiency and self-production of, um, of, of growing food at the refugee settlement level, um, there's market relationships. There are economic relationships between refugees and host communities. And knowing how those relationships are impacted, uh, the trading uh, relationships, how those are impacted by uh, drought impacts is, is a, a quite an important part of this, not just to understand what's happening to refugees, but also what's happening to non-refugee host communities um, for uh, similar concerns, but of course we would have um, perhaps different uh, sort of opportunities uh, for interventions or support um, for food aid um, or cash aid as needed. Um, uh, thinking more broadly than too, we're just focused on Uganda here, but um, and it, Uganda has that unique condition of providing access to arable land for refugees. Um, you know, that, that should give greater uh, degree of resilience to climate impacts. Um, we haven't really put all those pieces together yet to say if that's actually happening. Uh, it seems like it should. It's in a good position too, but we we just don't really have that full picture yet. Um, we we also don't know what's happening in other countries. We don't have this kind of integration that we've speaking about at the beginning of the slide between earth observation, interview data, food security assessments at the household level. So it's really a nascent um, effort to try to better tie all these things together to understand um, how conditions on the landscape affect local households, how food aid affects local households in terms of food security, for example. Um, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle and, and we're really just, uh, this earth observation is a really important part of it that's uh, arguably underutilized. Um, uh, but I, I think bringing all these pieces together, we should be in a much better place to sort of comprehensively say, uh, what's happening um, at the refugee settlement and refugee household level with regard to um, to food security going forward. Uh, we have a list of references here. Um, take a look at these. These are listed throughout the presentation and um, we'd like to acknowledge uh, the people listed here for their support in pulling together this presentation and um, I'll hand it back to Sean. Jamin and Sitian, Excellent presentation and demonstration, examining crop productivity and climate relationships in northern Uganda. Before we transition to the question and answer session, I want to remind you there will be one homework assignment which you will be able to access from the training page today. Answers must be submitted by Google Form with a due date of July 5th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after completion of the course. Below is the contact information for Mr. Xiang, Dr. Vandenhoek, and Dr. Estes, along with links to the RSET website and social media. We hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings, and please follow us on social media. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order that they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage by next week. Thank you to everybody who's been submitting questions. We got some really good ones so far. So uh, there's still there's tell time. So please do submit if you have a question that you have not submitted. Uh, but why don't we jump right into it? Question number one. Has the seasonality of conflict slash movements of refugees ever been seen, maybe related to the seasonality of crops or climate seasons? And whoever answered that, feel free to unmute. I guess I'll go ahead and answer this. Uh, so this was answered by. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. We, we can. Hey. Move. Sorry. I, I thought it was unmuted. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Please, okay. uh, Jamie. Go ahead. Thanks. 
sorry for that. Um, I was saying this is a good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of an emergent line of thinking to try to investigate this in a systematic way. Um, as the written answer states, the key thing to remember here is that the movement, you know, refugees um, are uh, technically legally people that are fleeing conflict. Um, and so that sort of seasonality of crops or climatic conditions would therefore have to be directly associated with conflict itself um, to have that timing sort of sync up. And uh, we certainly know of cases where that happens. I, I include one just, you know, the sort of typical, which is lean season um, crop harvest rating, um, which we see in a lot of different contexts. There's also in the um, Afghanistan context, there was the, the so-called fighting season. Um, and that doesn't play out everywhere in the same way. Um, but certainly there are there are um, factors associated with food security, food insecurity um, that would be that would be coupled with uh, conflict dynamics. We're still sort of at the edge of really understanding how um, sort of climatic fluctuation um, affects specifically climate change impacts affects the timing and the magnitude and the type of conflict that's very, very much an emergent sort of line of thinking with uh, groups on both sides saying that, you know, the, the relationships are not clear at all, or they are very clear. So, um, uh, but in any event, um, we would have to have some correlation to, uh, to the actual, to the fighting um, that would drive to the violence or threat of persecution that would drive refugee movement. Um, I haven't really, I just did a little, a quick review um, following the, the question being posed, and I didn't see much on that, um, but, you know, it, it, it certainly stands to reason that there are going to be relationships. I just don't think that it's been studied systematically yet, but it's a, it's a really good question. Great. Thank you, Jamin. Question number two, what advancements are being made in the field of noise reduction for Earth observation data, particularly with the integration of AI and machine learning? Um, yeah, I can answer this questions. Um, yeah, so first, I think the, the major challenge based on our experience using um, Earth observations is the is might be lack of sufficient data or observations. So when there are enough observations, and I think noise reduction would not be a, a major problem and might not even require advanced methods. But again, AI and machine learning can be used for for gap filling using spatial temporal relationships to to estimate the value of a certain pixel at a certain place at time. Um, there's also a, a trend towards using multi-sensor fusion to create gap field and higher spatial resolution time series data um, with machine learning algorithms and playing a key role in the fusion process. So for models, generative adversarial um, networks, GAN, and other self-supervised training methods are being used for gap filling, um, including newer foundation models such as DritView, um, which is based on vision transformer model. Um, and also, so if the goal is just for, for noise reduction only, then I believe we can follow a similar approach by leveraging a larger data set and longer observation periods. We can better distinguish between noise and signal. And also sometimes those um, those noise are from cloud, and and I think it, there will be a lot of studies on how to detect in cloud and, and filter out that cloud signal. Yeah, that's my answer to this question. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Satyan. Question okay. three, uh, could you provide case study examples or refer to effective climate resilience strategies that have emerged from your research or experience specifically tailored to enhance agricultural livelihoods in refugee settings? Hi, um, yep, another good question. Um, the key relationships here that we're interested in is, is just about any, you know, we would look after the same relationships in a non humanitarian setting as well, which is what promotes agricultural resilience. Um, and that's access to land. That's access to productive land. Um, and access to markets, um, with sufficient, uh, labor to, to, um, undertake 
those those livelihood opportunities. In refugee context, of course, it's a little bit constrained um, because. Okay, my son in the background there. Um, we of course don't have those kinds of. We can't take those for granted in refugee contexts. Refugees don't necessarily have access to land. If they do have access to land, it's not necessarily um, productive land. It could be marginal or degraded land. Um, and access to markets, socioeconomic integration is not a uh, just foregone conclusion. So these key ingredients have to be in place um, to for for refugees or really any community to develop this kind of agricultural climate resilient livelihood. Um, I think I don't have the full tally, but really there's, if, I, if I'm recalling correctly, six to eight countries that even allow refugees access to agriculture land. So this is this is definitely in the minority. Most do not have access to land. So in terms of building that kind of livelihood opportunity and certainly making resilient, um, that's kind of step number one is, is providing uh, refugees access to land that they can actually grow crops for their own consumption or for sale. And I provide a couple of, of links there that um, that kind of look at this from a few different directions, but a um, very good question. Thanks. Thank you, Jamin. Question number four, what is the definition of NDVI anomalies in this analysis? Yeah, um, so the anomalies here are really the, the residuals from the linear trend that you have fit to the data. So that you can isolate the annual effects more effectively. And so we convert the NDVI time series into, we also convert the NDVI time series into crop productivity metrics. Um, so we also have NDVI uh, max or NDVI seasonal, uh, seasonal max, NDVI seasonal integral anomalies measured on annual basis. So that really helps you to just focusing on the, um, uh, the deviation or the, the variance to the long-term mean. Yep. Great, thanks, Etienne. Uh, question number five, did you perform collinearity tests for the multivariate analysis? Uh, we haven't done the multi-collinearity test for, for the re regression since we only have two predictors from separate other variables. Um, but I think multi-collinearity is, is crucial in dealing with large number of closely related variables, especially if you aim to understand the impact of specific variables um, on the dependent variable. But, um, well, I, I think more advanced models could also be implemented, and also we, we can apply this multi-collinearity test. But um, in our code, it is just a simple demonstration of potential relationships between crop productivity and weather variables. So we didn't um, do, you know, apply a lot of those statistical um, techniques. Great, thanks, Etienne. Question six: The guide says to access these GeoJSON files, please create a shortcut to the NASA RSA 2024 data folder shared with you, and add the shortcut directly under your My Drive folder. So, was it shared with us, or should we download it from GitHub, GitHub, and then upload it to Drive? Uh, yes, so the data is shared through GitHub. Um, so you need to either uh, place it in the Google Google Drive folder or directly upload to the um, Colab directory. Perfect. Thank you, Satin. Uh, question seven. Did you apply any filtering of NDBI based on the quality band? Yes, we, we did applied filter for both Modis and Sentinel-2 uh, using their QA bands. So actually, we, uh, you can see that in the code. So we have a, a line in our data preprocessing -pre pipeline called dot map S2 mask clouds. So that's the function we used for um, filtering the, like I applied the QA bands for Sentinel-2. And also we have a dot map um, bracket mask Modis QA um, that is used for applying QA band for Modis. Great, thank you, Satyan. And question number eight, is there any key difference in the analysis when applied to humanitarian applications compared to other applications? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I, I wouldn't imagine that there's gonna be any difference in the technical approach 
Um, but of course, the driving questions, the social context, the availability of other data, the, the sort of policy implications, that's why we have this training, which is uh, not just a training on agricultural drought monitoring, but it's a training on this in humanitarian settings is to, it's to think about that context. Um, is to think about some of the how the societal context informs the decisions that are made. So the actual technical approach, you're right, NDVI works everywhere um, just as well. Um, but it's the considerations um, that I think are different. It's also important to note that humanitarian contexts are um, broadly underserved by Earth observation data. We have much, much more information in what's happening outside of humanitarian context than in. And so we're hoping that, that this kind of training helps provide some of that foundational context to motivate these applications in humanitarian settings. Great, thank you, Jamin. And question number nine, with the R value at less than one, what does this mean correlation-wise with regards to the series of CAs done in the notebook? I think I'm answering that one as we speak, so I'll just speak to it. So, uh, and there's there's two concepts here. There's R and R squared. R is the correlation coefficient, which measures the association strength of the association between two variables assessed in in, in linear terms. Is there a linear association? So it ranges from minus one to one, where negative one and one indicate respectively a negative, a perfect negative association. So the variables are perfectly correlated. Uh, but in a negative direction. So as X increases, Y declines. Um, whereas positive one indicates perfect positive association as X increases, so does Y. Um, zero means there's no association, so really no relationship between the variables. I think this refers to the second part, which is R squared, which is the square of the correlation coefficient, which roughly describes that, that ranges between zero and one and describes it uh, gives you a, a measure of how much uh, variance in the dependent variable, the Y variable, is uh, explained or accounted for by uh, variation, the variation in the independent variable or variables. Um, and so as you move from zero to one, the dependent variables account from incre account for increasingly more of the percent of variation explained by uh, a, a variation in the Y variable. So when you get to one, that means your model perfectly captures the variation, uh, it perfectly explains the, the changes in the Y variable and it's a perfect predictor basically. Uh, and as you get further away from one and closer to zero, your model is increasingly less predictive or able to explain the variation. That's, I think that's about it. Great, thanks, Lyndon. Uh, question number 10, how have the recent EO advancements improved the pre-disaster preparedness and hotspot analysis? Can you give recent examples? Good question. I'd be curious to hear Lyndon and Satine's take on this too. Um, I would just say that I think with the plurality of sensors we have, um, we're more vigilant. Um, we're able to see more of the earth at any given time, especially with different modalities, such as active radar, as well as passive optical. Um, of course, we know the sort of textbook benefits of radar, being able to see through the clouds, um, detect things at night, even without, you know, visible sunlight. Um, those are certainly really helpful. Um, but I, I think a lot of the, um, the benefits are also coming through different satellite modalities of uh, CubeSats, NanoSats, SmallSats, uh, just more, more coverage, um, more frequent visits at uh, different scales of data, at different resolutions, I mean, um, sometimes different, you know, uh, multi-spectral configurations give us different sensitivity, um, looking at um, some of the more subtle, like red edge features or coastal blue bands, also give us uh, more more nuanced takes on things from from uh, new sensors as well. Um, so, I mean, the overall, the greater coverage um, that we're provided with this ever expanding constellation um, is certainly helpful. On the algorithmic side, too, um, automated 
sort of first cut analyses are extremely helpful. So AI driven sort of uh, tip and queue frameworks where we can have a sort of blunt assessment of change, um, whether it's with regard for thinking about disasters, something like landslide or or um, uh, flooding, um, the, some of these phenomena that happen very quickly and often um, without sort of advanced warning at, as, well as with regards to the locality. Um, readily deployable models uh, that can help us detect those kinds of changes very quickly. Um, things like drought, um, again, I'm curious to hear from Lin and Sitian, but, but those, you know, those are, uh, have a seasonal signal. Those are sort of longer term, slow, sort of slow onset disasters in a lot of cases. Um, those are, I think, is really where the strength of this training comes in is we really need to have that really well established historical time series to understand when we're starting to see these anomalous trends. It's not just a on off, you know, no disaster and then disaster. It, it creeps over a long period of time. So, you know, uh, drought is is very, very difficult to to address. Um, we don't have much recourse often or pretending to drought. We can map it and monitor it. But um, how do you stop a drought? Um, um, impossible as far as I'm aware. So, um, but curious to hear the other presenters' thoughts. Yeah, I could just jump in maybe with one example of how uh, Earth observation advances help. Um, so, just I know, you know, work we've been involved in is just the increasing availability of high spatial and temporal resolution data make it increasingly possible to map. Uh, where people are farming and living with more, you know, with more precision, providing data that uh, is useful for things such as um, understanding, like who's being, who is potentially going to be impacted by, by flooding. Um, you know, so, if a lot of places you don't have good cropland maps um, because it's been very hard to do with older generation sensors, and so now with new algorithms, particularly you know, neural networks uh, applied to things like uh, planet imagery, which uh, is important for two reasons. It's got the basically the daily coverage, which allows you to get at least, a, give you a better ability to assemble a seasonal mosaic uh, in really cloudy regions, which is quite hard to do with um, less frequent sensors. And the high resolution gives the ability to map, you know, smaller fields more effectively. So you can start to get a sense of where, you know, better sense of where people are farming. That's, uh, you know, more resolved than it was previously. So that really helps uh, people thinking on, on applications like that, like who's going to be affected when it floods as one example. And similar, you can make a similar case for drought related issues too. Who's going to be, who's impacted in this area where that, um, is being impacted by, a, say, a flash drought, you know, short term drought that maybe is of limited spatial extent, which newer, um, you know, rainfall data sets, uh, satellite based data sets that give better weather estimates are more able to detect themselves. So you get a better picture of where the droughts might be happening. Great. Well, I want to thank everybody for one for posing these really great questions and two for everybody for answering them so thoroughly. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, that does conclude uh, this three part uh, uh, webinar series. I wanted before we wrap up today, I wanted to give all of the guest instructors an opportunity if they had any uh, maybe closing thoughts or comments to the participants that took uh, today's training and also all three parts of this training. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Estes, if we can start with you, any any closing thoughts or, or comments? I was just thank you. Thanks for the interest. It's our first time participating in this, so it's been an interesting experience. And thanks for all the thoughtful questions. And we welcome any suggestions for improvements. Wonderful, and thank you so much. And and Sitian, any closing thoughts or comments for our participants? Yeah, same. Just thank you for for joining um, this event, and just feel free to ask questions. Great, awesome. And Dr. Vandenhoek. Likewise, thanks to the RSET team for pulling all this together. Uh, as usual, did a great job, and um, thanks to the pan uh, to the uh, fellow panelists, and also to all the participants for asking the great questions. Appreciate it.
Great. Well, I would uh, want to uh, recognize the amazing instructors we had today, uh, Dr. Dr. Lyndon Estes, Sitian Chang, and Dr. Jamin Vandenhook. I also want to recognize the RSET team uh, for working in the background to make this uh, training possible. That's Natasha Johnson Griffin, Brock Levins, Selwyn Hudson Odoi, Jonathan O'Brien, and Sarah Cutshaw. And most importantly, I want to thank all the participants. Uh, we know that you all have busy lives and you all joining from all over the world. It's, it's really great that you're able to join and, and participate in this three part webinar series. So really appreciate uh, your time and also the, the, the thought that you put into the questions. We wish you all the best and, and please do reach out if you want to, you know, uh, you know, if there's any questions you had post training, uh, please do reach out to, to any of us. We look forward to seeing you at our uh, future RSET training. So thanks to everybody and take care.